Christian, who helps me with these hangouts. Hey, Carol. Hey. You're at the Institute right now, right? I am. I'm camping out in somebody's office. This isn't my office, and he's got lots of stuff. So I have like flashing lamps and all kinds of stuff around me. It's very cool. Posters and whatever. Uh, I know. Uh, I've been in that office. He's got all kind of rocket models and everything else in there. It's really cool. It's pretty funny. So anyway, welcome to Afternoon Astronomy Coffee. As you said, uh, as we have said all along, that this is sponsored by and supported by the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronautical Society. And um, the idea is an informal chat with the real researchers who are doing the science with a variety of telescopes around the world. And today we're going to hear about a very interesting planet. Well, I'm looking cool. forward to it. Yeah, me too. Okay, so if, as we always do, we uh, I'm, I'm streaming on a lot of things, and I try not to cross my streams. I know better, but sometimes <laughs> it happens anyway. We are streaming on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and Periscope. So I hope you will uh, follow us on one of those uh, stream, uh, channels and leave us questions and comments. On Twitter in particular, I have a new toy. Uh, if you use the hashtag AstroCoffee, which is down there, I will actually see it on the Twitter feed. And, I, and, and if you tweet something, uh, I can put it up here on the screen as well. So um, definitely try and make use of that if you can. So that's AstroCoffee on Twitter, as well as you can just, we're on, I'm on the live chat and all the regulars are out. I see a lot of you guys on, on the live chat on YouTube. So that's good. Philip W., uh, Eric Mazino's back, and John Suffol. And we're also on Discord. If you know about deep astronomy and Discord, then you can uh, communicate with us on that um, platform as well. Okay, so let me bring up my guests today. We are, um, our guests today are from, hang on, let me pull up that. My guests today are, uh, are, are, are astronomers who have used the uh, Hubble Space Telescope to observe uh, this, the Kepler 13AB that we're talking about. Um, in the upper right, or in the upper left, I'm sorry, is uh, Dr. Thomas Beatty. He's from Penn State University. Uh, hi, Thomas. Welcome to our Hangouts. Good to see you. Hi, Tony. Um, welcome to, good to be here. Thanks for having welcome me. To, good to be here. Yeah, you're okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and also next to him, but not really next to him in actual space time, uh, is uh, Dr. Avi Sporer. He is from MIT, or at least you've just got there, I understand, right? You are new to there. Yeah, I recently moved from uh, all the way from California to to Massachusetts. And now I'm visiting California. And now you're back in really California. <laughs> that explains the dearth of books behind you there. Okay, so you just yeah. haven't fully moved in yet. Is that the thing? <laughs> Something like that. Okay, yeah. All right, good. Well, um, so if um, I what I try to do whenever possible, in this case I was able to do it, there is a link in the description box on YouTube and in the Facebook description of the paper that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, This is based on a press release. It's also on Hubble site uh, that you can read about as well. But uh, I know that this is is an Astro Coffee and we try to uh, bring the the experience that professional astronomers do to you. Uh, We wanted to give you the paper. So hope you can follow along. Don't forget to ask questions and comments. Okay, so let's start with you, Thomas. Tell us a little bit about this system. Kepler 13. Is it proper to just say Kepler 13? And then yeah, it has all these stars in it? That's a good question. So the nomenclature is a little confusing uh, sometimes. So yeah, so Kepler 13 is uh, the system itself, but the system is made up of three stars. Uh, and it's Kepler 13 because when Kepler actually discovered it, it was one of the first Kepler planets discovered. That's the Kepler Space Telescope, not Johannes Kepler. Just one. Yes. That's, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's a little bit more recent than Johannes Kepler. <laughs> um, so when the Kepler spacecraft found it, it uh, and Avi, you were the one who discovered it, right? Through the. Uh, um, uh, there were a few papers that came out at the same time, but that was uh, one of the more unusual planets that we discovered for the data that the Kepler telescope collected. Yeah. Um, so Avi was one of the discoverers, and uh, but when Kepler sees it, uh, it sees it as just a single point. So it gets flagged as Kepler-13, uh, and then we later found out that there were three stars there, uh, two that are very massive, that are... Uh, almost twice the mass of the sun. Uh, and one of them has a planet and one of them has a smaller star 
or vignette. Uh, so there's Kepler 13, capital A, capital B, and capital C. The capital letters uh, all mean stars. Okay, and so that sounds like a pretty complicated uh, a system. What kind of stars are each of those, A, B, and C? So A and B are coincidentally uh, very similar. There's sort of uh, early A stars that are each about 8,000 degrees Kelvin, um, which I'm trying to think what that translates to in Fahrenheit. I think it's about 16,000 Fahrenheit. Um, so they are uh, very hot, uh, they're very bright, and then uh, the third star is orbiting Kepler 13b. So there's one, and then there's two other guys sort of going around, um, actually pretty far away from each other, these two. Um, so B and C, C is uh, uh, maybe about 4,000 Kelvin, uh, it's, which is about 8,000 Fahrenheit, so it's much smaller. Um, that one's harder to see. You can pull apart uh, A and B. You can look, and they're bright enough that you can see both of them if you look close enough. Kepler 13 C, nobody's actually seen directly. Okay, so the exoplanet we're talking about today, little b, is around the star 13 capital A, and that is a <laughs> it is a dwarf star, right? Uh, yes. Well, so it's a dwarf star. All dwarf here means is that it's uh, it's not a giant star. It's a little bit of a weird moment. <laughs> I think we're historical. <laughs> I think that a hundred years ago, everybody knew about giant stars, and so yeah, yeah. the dwarfs. Uh, <laughs> weirdly enough, dwarf here just means normal. Oh, that okay, good. Well, I suppose that's politically correct too, on, on many levels. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> is this all right? So tell us. Okay, so Kepler thirteen A is one of these planet A, A B is one of these so called hot Jupiter planets. Right now, I'm going to pull up this little graphic here while you talk oops um why is it not hang on just a sec let me do this spinning on my computer there we go um there let me get rid of all this so this is the uh a, a sort of a cartoon of the planet compared with our uh with our planets in our solar system so this is known as a, a hot jupiter now we've talked about hot jupiters before but let's give us a little summary of what those are and um you know how common are they things like that sure so hot jupiters are actually something that was very they were discovered uh about 20 years ago uh, and it was very surprising when they were found uh, physically what it is is it's a planet the size of jupiter that's just very close to its star they're usually 1500 Kelvin, uh, 2000. Kepler 13 AB is actually 3000 Kelvin, which is about 5000 or 6000 Fahrenheit. Um, so they're very close to their stars. Uh, they usually take only a couple of days to go around in their orbits. So a year on these planets is only a couple of days. And when they were discovered, it actually it was very confusing to astronomers because nobody expected a planet the size of Jupiter to be able to exist that close to a star. Because the idea was that uh, there's not enough material that close to a star for these planets to form. Um, so it wasn't expected that we were going to find any, but it turns out planets actually migrate and they move around a lot after they've formed initially. So all these planets have presumably formed much further out from their star around where Jupiter is in our solar system. And then they move in uh, in the first couple hundred million years of uh, the star's lifetime and to where we see them today. Right. And so and I, part oh. of the reason that we know about hot Jupiters more than say the same kind of planet further out is because, because they are close and because they're easier to detect? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a very good question. Yes, uh, m most of the planets we know about are, are uh, a lot of them are hot Jupiters, um, but hot Jupiters only occur around maybe 1%. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, and that's, just, yeah, exactly because they're the easiest kinds of planets to detect. They're large, very close to their stars, so they're bright, and they exert a lot of, um, you know, one of the primary ways we find them besides transits is through RV, radio velocity observation, where we watch the star wobble back and forth. And hot Jupiters give a, give the biggest wobble possible for a planet. So they're the easiest to see in transits and the easiest to see in radio velocity. So we find a lot of them, even if they're not actually that common. Well, if I remember right, when we do a census of, of exoplanets that are out there, most of them, there are quite a few are hot Jupiters, but most of them, I think, are Neptune-sized. Is that right? If we um, 
Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a good question. That's, uh, that's a lot of people, I think, are arguing over what exactly this statistic is. It keeps changing, but there's a, my point is there's a lot of biases in this, right? I mean, hot, there may be a lot of hot Jupiters only because we just they're easier to see, like you say. In the radial velocity method, they're pulling the star around. In the case of a transit method, they're blocking. We get a lot of light dips uh, from those things. I mean, come on, a year of only a couple of days, you're going to get a lot of little dips and a lot of information. The ones we're missing are the ones that have years of that are more like our Earth, right? Or even our own Jupiter, which has a year of what is the year of Jupiter? It's it's a uh, year. Something like that. It's how much? It's how long? Uh, I think it's eleven years. Eleven, 11. years, right? So uh, you got to telescope like Kepler, which is really only observing for five years or so, uh, you'd miss that. So, you know, you wouldn't see those. You might see one dip, but you won't get two. Um, so anyway, that's a good that's a good uh, sort of primer into why, you know, we see more kinds of exoplanets and others using the techniques that we have. So, um, okay, so we've got a hot Jupiter here, a little bit bigger than Jupiter, very hot, 5,000 or six or 7,000 or so degrees Fahrenheit. Um, oh, we didn't mention the, that this is about 18, 1,700 light years away. So it's, we're not going to be, um, you know, traveling by there anytime soon, it looks like. Um, but let's, so, Avi, did you, did, did he just say you actually discovered this? Uh, yeah, you can say that. Uh, it wasn't a formal discovery like uh, other uh, planets are discovered because um, uh, th this planet is um, unique, but it's also a bit more complicated. Uh, f just, just for example, um, the star this planet is orbiting, like uh, Thomas said, is uh, bigger and hotter than the sun. It is bigger by roughly 70% in radius and mass than the sun and and it's pretty hot and because of uh, how the spectra or the spectrum of these stars look like we cannot measure the the radial velocity of these stars to to high precision which is usually the method that we weigh those planets measure the the mass we monitor the as the star actually goes or orbits the common center of mass of the star planet system. And from that uh, motion, we can uh, estimate the mass of the planet, but we cannot apply this technique to okay. this kind of uh, star, which um, really does not allow us to study the planet population uh, of planets orbiting hot stars at this mass and, and, and beyond. So uh, we had to use another technique, which was um, uh, what we did. We have, uh, we have data from Kepler, which is almost uh, four years of continuous uh, monitoring of the amount of light coming from, uh, coming from that system. So not only that we see very, very nice and very clear transits as the planet crosses in front of the star and decreases the amount of light that we see by roughly 1%, very roughly. Uh, the data is so good from Kepler because Kepler is really good, really good and the star is actually one of the brighter stars that Kepler has monitored, uh, that we can see very, very small modulations, meaning variability along the orbit itself, outside of these... Uh, of the transit and also outside of the secondary eclipse when the planet goes behind the star. So we can study these modulations, which have a very, very small amplitude, smaller than one part in 10,000. So at this level of precision, wow. we start to talk in, in PPM, in part per million. So we say this is 10 PPM, this is 100 PPM. Um, th these are the... Well, the, and the reason that the, these light curves are so good, though, isn't it, Avi, is that... Kepler was designed to detect variations in brightness for Earth-sized exoplanets, exactly. so it needed yeah. this level of precision yeah. to be able. And so, with a with a hot Jupiter like Kepler thirteen AB, then you know you get really good data. So Kepler right. thirteen means it, it started out. I just like to follow this because I've never really talked about the chain of command here for Kepler mm -hmm. exoplanets, and that is Kepler thirteen started out as the thirteenth region. What is it called? Object of interest, KOI. 
Then it got confirmed. Yeah. It started. It needed to be confirmed. Then it got confirmed by something else, somebody else, some other observations, probably from the ground, where it became Kepler thirteen A B. Right. So yes, so... that's sort of how exoplanets get vetted. <laughs> right. Yeah. The 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 terminology you mentioned, Kepler object of interest or KOI, um, that is basically a list of interesting object that the Kepler mission uh, releases. Yes. They are not all good planet candidates, but they are just interesting objects that we should keep on the list and keep looking at them. And this KOI was number 13 on the list, and somehow he also got the name Kepler 13. He got the, the planet number was is the same as the KOI number, which... I don't think it's the case for any other planet. So it's really, just, I thought, oh, that's yeah. interesting. Okay, so I thought you, like when you that. became an object of interest number 13, you also, when you got confirmed, you became Kepler planet 13. No, that's actually very rare. I'm not sure exactly how that happened. Wow. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, see, that's good. I'm, glad, I'm glad I went there because uh, because these objects of interest are just, Kepler takes a bunch of data, it's automatically processed and it just flags these things and then it takes not necessarily a person, but somebody to go back and look more closely right. at these at these right. objects to make sure okay real yes. quick i just want to say galaxia and achilles solved our problem 12 years for jupiter uh, and of course achilles 308 11 point um 11 point eight six two earth years thank so, you thank you okay. guys. thank you for, for that clarifying that uh, appreciate <laughs> it um this is why we have Yay, um, galaxia we have great great uh, viewers here to help us out yeah they um, help us out that's right if you have a question use that big question mark emoticon thing and i will get to it um and, and uh we will go from there okay so whew, okay so we've got a um We've narrowed down a little bit about how this was discovered. Kepler found it. Kepler, uh, and the, you, the, this, because it uses the transit method, was probably found this way. Although, uh, mm -hmm. although Thomas, you mentioned radial velocity. That's where you look at the wobble. This gives you a sense of how big it is. And um, also, um, perhaps its orbital period, things like that. What are some of the things? You guys used the Hubble Space Telescope to you to look at this so tell us a little bit about your observations uh we know that the wifc3 is an ir camera but tell us a little bit more about the observations that you took sure so the observations we did were we we were looking at the planet as it went behind the star so the transit is when it passes behind the star and an eclipse is when the planet passes behind the star completely it's like a it, it's like an occultation almost right it goes or, uh, or can you still yeah. kind of see it Yep. Actually, depending upon who you talk to, uh, it should be called an occultation, but for whatever reason, everybody calls it an eclipse. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, it kind of is. I mean, it is an eclipse, I suppose. Um, but it, it, there's there's varying... I've heard the term used a couple of ways. If the plane of the orbit is directly in our line of sight, then it will get occulted by the star. But right. if it's kind of tilted up a little bit or down, the orbit, mm -hmm. the plane of the exoplanet, you can still see it as it goes behind. Yeah, well, so, and, and if the orbit is in circular, if it's uh, eccentric and sort of oval shaped, you'll get a, you can get an offset as well, and you not see the eclipse. How can the, I don't get that? If the just because uh, it's well, elliptical, it's, too, it's still yeah. going to need to be tilted, or else you're, you yeah, know, right. regardless if it's an well, ellipse or a circle. Well, suppose that you 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 have this beautiful alignment where the closest approach is in the front. And then it goes out like that, and then it comes back in. Right. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, I see that. Sure, sure. That but that is it, an astronomical so conspiracy, happen. but it yeah, might it happen. Is, it is. I'm just saying. <laughs> it could but happen. rarely, it, it actually happen. does happen. Right. Billions and billions of planets. So. <laughs> I mean, doesn't HD 80606 do that? It only shows an eclipse. It's a very eccentric orbit. And the, the, we only see it go behind. We don't see it go in front. I love uh, exoplanet astronomers. Uh, hey, um, Avi, doesn't HP 606? I mean, <laughs> you, you just imagine they're talking to themselves in these. You know, what about, uh, what about uh, HP uh, 3826 or whatever it is? <laughs> right. Yeah, all these telephone numbers that you start to remember. <laughs> exactly. Dad, that's right. That's right. I that this is why we're on the spectrum, all of us. <laughs> right. That's right. Myself included. I, yeah, I know we're all kind of on the spectrum. Like, a little that bit. We remember these necessary. random numbers. What <laughs> about HD one five three eight two nine? Oh, that's good. Okay. Uh, 
Oh yeah, anyway. but anyway, so I forgot where we were now. I was, I'm sitting here thinking of that. I'm trying to think of that alien megastructures one. That was the only one I ever had memorized. I think that was HIP. Well, anyway, I was just gonna say. So, so what Avi was talking about a little bit, which was the springboard for the current conversation, is if you simplistically think of it, the star is shining and the planet's out here, and then it passes in front, and then there's a dip, and then. You know, the planet is out here and then it goes around and then you don't see the planet. So you might get a little dip there. But when mm -hmm. it's in its orbit, whether you have the star and the planet, you're getting the light from both. Right. Um, and, you know, early on, the the contrast was or the sensitivity of the observation was such was we mostly saw the star. But now things are have been observed so much and with such sensitivity, you're actually getting light from both. So it isn't just a simple dip and then it comes back up. Other stuff might be happening. Uh, yeah, so that's actually, that right? yeah, that's actually a very cool set of observations. So that's not what we did. But one thing you can do is if you watch over an entire orbit as it goes around, you effectively, it's like you see like almost the phases of Venus. You see the bright day side and it rotates out and then you get the dark. So you could do that. Right. And so you see these phase curves where you see the day side rotate into view and it gets brighter and then it goes behind and it dips and then it comes back out and then you see it get dimmer as the night side rotates into view. Yeah, that's, uh, you can think about it a little bit as the phases of the moon, a little bit, not exactly the same, but similar. Yeah. And actually through that analysis of those phase curves, we were able to estimate the mass of the planet. Mm because we cannot get uh, precise radio velocities for this star because it's so hot. So the usual way of estimating the mass of the planet could not be applied for this planetary system. Uh, that's one of the reasons this planet is like interesting and, and unique. And we uh, went to HST, or to Hubble Space Telescopes, and to get the the data. So we proposed and we were awarded because this uh, <laughs> is such an interesting uh, planet. Uh, and maybe I'll let Thomas uh, describe in more detail the observation we, we did with HST. Yeah, we right. talked about the Hubble time allocation process quite a bit. It's really interesting to me especially, but how many orbits did you get, uh, Tom? Uh, we had uh, 12 orbits. So we looked at wow. two orbits and we had six orbits uh, for each. So uh, for everybody listening, the way uh, HST awards time, so if you're on a ground-based telescope, uh, like I have uh, a night on a telescope coming up in a week, and usually time on telescopes is awarded by nights or right. by hours. Right. And the, the unit they use is orbits, one uh, you know, uh, orbit around the Earth, which is about 96 minutes. So it's sort of one. And strangely more. enough, that's going to be the unit for a JWST, even though it's out at L2. So I thought that was weird. I didn't, the, huh. the, the units of, of time allocation, I think it's going to be the same. Still going to be orbits? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I, think it, I have to double check with Alberto, but I believe that's what it was. Anyway, so you had, uh, you had all these orbits and uh, you used WIFC3, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wide field camera three. So it's an infrared detector. So it observes, uh, we observe from about, 1.1 to 1.6 microns, which is which was chosen when they were designing the instrument, because there's a big uh, water absorption feature right in the middle of that. So if you look at a, a spectrum of water, like in the Earth's atmosphere, water absorbs a lot of light at about 1.4 uh, microns. Uh, visual light uh, is about 0.6 microns. So this is about twice, a little over twice the wavelength. One of the reasons being in space is very helpful. Yes, and that's exactly why they put it there, because there's no way to do these observations from the ground. So they said, if we choose one region to look at, we're going to do something we can't do from the ground. Um, and the advantage for us is that if we're looking at these exoplanet atmospheres, which are expected to have a lot of water, is we can see the water in the atmosphere when we get their spectrum, because we can see that big water absorption feature right at 1.4 microns. Um, so the observations we did were we looked at it um, for two eclipses. And the funny thing about uh, Hubble observations is that because you're going around the Earth uh, every 96 minutes, uh, for half that time, the Earth is in between you and the star you're looking at. Um, so you get these gaps. You're sort of on for 45 minutes, you're off. You're on for 45 minutes, you're off. Um, and so we have these six 
for each eclipse, these six uh, sort of observational blocks that we have to stitch together. Um, and uh, the funny thing about this was that uh, starting a couple years ago, this is going to get a little inside baseball. The, uh, uh, <laughs> That's why we're here, man. <laughs> Lay it on us. So the preferred way now numbers, is, no, If you can use numbers, that would be great too. Uh, yeah, well, I'll try. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Here's that's number eight. five. Let it, lay it, lay it on us. No, we're, that's, that's why we're here. Actually, my favorite number is seven. So if you can work that in the conversation, that'd be great. All right. I'm I can work 42, but we can work uh, 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 Right. So a couple of years ago, people realized the way to do these observations with, with, with WSTE 3 is usually if you look at uh, a star, the detector will saturate. You'll get too much photons, it'll blow itself out, and it'll stop. So that gives you a, a maximum time you can look at something. Uh, but there's also a readout time. It takes a certain amount of time for the detector to dump the image out. Um, so uh, I think it was Peter McCullough realized that you could scan it. You sort of nod HST. It sort of slowly just pitches while you're observing, and that smears everything out. You're getting these little spectra. So you're getting these long bars of light. And then HST is pitching, so you, that smears up and down the image. Um, and then it allows you to observe longer and gives you a much higher precision for these sorts of things. So that's been, uh, once they, uh, that was figured out a couple years ago, pretty much everybody's been using that, that method. Um, it's not a pretty one, but it's, it's, it gets you more information, right? You don't get pretty yeah, pictures it, out of that. Everything's smeared. You have smeared. to keep in mind that uh, any HST and all the instruments on HST were never designed, were never built to do this kind of an observation. So we are basically using a, 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 a really great tool, but not to the task it was built for. So you need to improvise. Oh, yeah. believe me, astronomers are great at that. No <laughs> other great example of that is with frontier fields using galaxy clusters as lenses yeah. to make Hubble more powerful. Although, although JWST was designed with all this in mind. So that, that's, at least that's one of the reasons right. Community so excited to yes. lessons uh, learned. Hands on it. Yeah. Yes, Peter is com Peter Q is commenting. Tabby Star Tony. Yes, I know. K I C eight four six two eight five two. There, that, that, I got it. Okay, I know, I know. Okay, um, Eric, I'm going to ask your question, but you always ask this question in every exoplanet hangout. But I'm going to ask it again. He, Eric Mazano, loves moons. Okay, he okay. always asks about moons. Does okay. Kepler thirteen A B have any moons? Not that we have seen. Uh, and I, I think I'd be surprised if it did. Uh, Avi, can you actually, do you remember is, we have a spin orbit alignment, right? Do you remember? So, the, I'm thinking about uh, the migration history and whether or not it would preserve moons as it came in. Yeah, so first, the, your answer to the, the question about moon is correct. Uh, we cannot see a moon, but that's, that's basically saying we don't know of it. We, can, we cannot completely rule it out, but there are some theoretical or dynamical arguments against the moon. Keep in mind, this planet is orbiting very, very close to its own star. The orbit is only 1.76 days, which is roughly 42 hours. Uh, <laughs> ah, so she did, he did it. He worked yeah. in the number, sort of. The answer you did. So it yeah. is very difficult to put another object, a moon, orbiting the planet without the tidal effects of the star completely disrupting that orbit and either throwing that moon away or uh, crushing it on the star or on the planet. Right. So that's Which... at least one reason where I, would, I wouldn't put money not myself and not my own money and not anyone else's money on having a moon out in that planet. Well, we, because be all, in addition to being so close, I don't know how many miles that equates to or, or kilometers from the star, this thing is probably tidally locked, right? Meaning that its orbital rotation period matches its, its spin axis rate. That's right. Yeah. So the, the rotation of the planet that's what I meant. is expected to be the, uh, at the same rate as the orbit, the same 42 uh, hours. Meaning that the same side of the planet always faces the star uh, as it rotates around the, as it revolves Meaning around the star. Meaning that one hemisphere of the planet is uh, continuously facing the star and other hemisphere is con 
uh, continuously facing away, like the moon is orbiting entirely locked to the Earth. Right. Okay. So probably the mo- a moon around such a thing would be weird. I don't, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, well, but maybe it could. Is it, is it also true that, it, that a moon might never form? Because of the tidal um, effects that you're talking, or do you think it would be actually possible for a moon to well, so I was that be thrown question. away? Right, that the process that brought it in so close to its star might. So uh, there might have been a moon, but then it, it went. Right, if there were a moon, that it seems likely it could have gotten thrown out by whatever caused it to move in. Well, right. that's right, because you said earlier in the Hangout, these planets have a tendency to form further out in the system and then migrate toward closer toward the sun. So anything could have happened. It could have had a whole bunch of moons, maybe 13, 14, like, you know, or 20, something like our own Jupiter. But as it migrated in, any number of things could have happened. Uh, Uh, I will say just on the, on the tidal locking, one interesting point uh, that we actually get from these face curves where we watch the day side come in is that the planet as a whole is locked so that it faces the star, but the atmosphere, the air is still rotating around it, right? It's as if like the surface of the earth was facing the star, but uh, the winds would still be moving around. Winds. Oh, sure. I guess that would, it would still play so, havoc on that atmosphere, but I see what you're saying. Right. Just, just right. because the same, well, now, wait a minute. This is a gas giant, right? This is like, right. the thing yeah. is all gas. So that doesn't this is make... what everybody asks. If it's all gas, if it's gas all the way down, how do you get it? Yeah, uh, so then it doesn't make sense to be tidally locked, does it? Well, so the, the point is, is that you can calculate the, the angular momentum of the planet as a whole. Like, if you took the entire planet, it's mainly the interior, the center part where most of the mass is. That's locked to the star. But the outer part of the atmosphere that we actually see is whipping around at probably winds of a kilometer or two kilometers per second uh, as it goes uh, from day to night and back again. Okay, so Peter, you... and so the wind, uh, so the wind is part of the clue to the rain. Yeah, okay. Understand. Yep. You were getting there. You were getting, you were, you were, you were anticipating. I know. Uh, just real quick, Peter Q, the universe is weird. Can't remember who said, whoever said that. Uh, that was me, Peter. I said that the, the universe is very weird. Okay. So yes, Carol, the press release said this planet is snowing sunscreen. That seemed to be the headline there. So that's weird. That is very weird. You want to tell us about that guys? Sure. So the, the, the idea is that um, I'm going to rewind a tiny bit. So the, the question we're trying to answer is, what is the temperature of the atmosphere as you move up and down within it? Uh, and you may think that, oh, as you get higher up, it gets colder, right? Um, but that's actually not the case for actually almost all the planets in the solar system. Like on Earth, uh, the stratosphere, as you're going up, you hit the stratosphere, and then it starts getting warmer as you go higher. And then this, you get out of the stratosphere and it gets colder again. Um, and so we've been looking to see if these stratospheres exist on other planets. Um, and the reason is, is that what we see when we look at these planets, like in these observations, is we see light coming out of the atmosphere. And we try and figure out from that light what the planet is made out of and what its composition is. And to do that, we need to relate, like the atmosphere temperature structure is the fundamental connective tissue between what the atmosphere is made out of and what we see in terms of the light coming out of it. So if we can understand the temperature structure, we can understand the planets. Um, So uh, originally it was thought that a lot of these planets would have these stratospheres, and that would be caused by titanium oxide gas, TiO gas, which we see in brown dwarfs, uh, which were about the same temperature, 2,000 degrees. Um, It's very prevalent in the universe. So this was thought to be a very logical thing for this, would cause these stratospheres. And and stratospheres have been detected? Uh, Yes. Uh, There was a... Uh, the first detection, the first real nice detection of one was probably two years ago, mm. also with HST. And then, but you could sort of, depending on who you talk to, you could debate that one. But there was a oh. very, <laughs> one, uh, over the summer in WASP 121, uh, had a very clear signature of one of these stratospheres. Um, and so we were looking at Kepler 13. And the thing is, both those planets are about the same temperature, They're both at about 3000 degrees Kelvin but they have very low surface gravities. They're puffy, right? Uh, the gravity on them is much lower than, well, it's higher than Earth, but it's, uh, 
uh, Kepler-13's gravity is probably 10 times higher than theirs. Wow. Um, so Kepler-13 is the same temperature, but its gravity is 10 times higher. And what we saw was when we looked at this is that we didn't see a stratosphere. We saw that it just, the higher up you go, the colder it gets. And because these other planets that are very similar in temperature and presumably in composition uh, do have this titanium oxide, which we expect to be just generically present everywhere, uh, and they have a stratosphere, and we don't see a stratosphere in Kepler-13, uh, the idea is that, type, that gas has been pulled out of the atmosphere somehow. It's been removed. So that it can't form a stratosphere, it can't cause the atmosphere to warm up at a certain point. Um, and it was predicted several years ago by uh, uh, papers by kind of Dave Spiegel and Vivienne Parmentier that one way you could remove this is that, uh, so there's hot gas on the day side, it swirls around at like two kilometers a second, it whips around to the night side. The night side is probably a thousand degrees. At that point, the titanium oxide can condense. It forms grains. It forms titanium dioxide, which is what's in sunscreen. Um, and at that point, it forms these grains, and it just starts falling. Uh, and in most of these planets, it only takes a couple hours to go across the night side. So it falls for a couple hours, but it doesn't fall far enough. And when it comes back to the day side, it heats up, it turns into the gas, and it goes back up and causes the stress. Okay, there you go, Philip W. That's the answer to your question about whether it is liquid or frozen. Uh, he had a question about whether it, when it falls, is it snow or is it liquid? And it sounds like you're, it's going back. It's it's grains. You called it grains on the dark side, right? So or on the far side. Yes. So that's why we sort of called it snow because it's a solid, really some sort of solidist material. But grains are the size of it is about the size of like the smoke that comes off a of wood fire. Like, those smoke particles are about the same size as these titanium oxide particles. And this showed up This showed up in the spectra of the planet. That's right. Well, so it's an interesting logical chain, actually. We don't actually see this directly. What we see is we don't... What we, it's what we don't see. We don't see a stratosphere. And all of our understanding of how these atmospheres work is that the stratospheres should be caused by titanium oxide. So, okay, why is the titanium oxide not there? Uh, and we have this prediction from several years ago that for high gravity planets on the night side, it should be sucked out in this cold trap, that it should snow out and fall into the center of the planet and stay there. Um, and so that's what we argued in the paper, that because they seem to almost perfectly match those theoretical predictions, that that uh, is what's happened. Cool. Okay. Um, so the... I was just going to read another question and it scrolled past me here. Um, uh, so I do, I do ha then have a question. You, you said that their titanium oxide of course has been seen in brown dwarfs and other stars. Ha has titanium oxide actually been seen in what is attributed to the planetary spectra? Uh, yes. So, um, WASP-121, one of the reasons why it has a very nice stratosphere protection is that because they... Because of that. They, they actually saw directly okay. to the side of its atmosphere. So that all fits. Great. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. I found I found the question. Uh, Yurik Mazino is asking, do we have any long-term predictions for the evolution of this planet as its atmosphere loses titanium oxide, which rains down on the surface? Short and long-term predictions um i don't know i have one i can think about evaporation avi i'd be interested to hear uh if you have any predictions i was going to say I, the interesting thing would be whether or not the planet is evaporating so these hot planets because they're so close to the star the atmosphere is getting blown off um which is probably happening here but usually that blow off rate is so low it doesn't it doesn't right. really affect the planet's mass so, you know it'll lose this sounds huge. It'll lose 10 Earth masses or something of its atmosphere uh, during its lifetime. But the planet itself weighs a thousand times the mass of the Earth, so it's not a large... I don't know if you have any different thoughts on it. Um, I don't think... There might be some mass loss, but like you said, it's not something that will be significant. But there is uh, another uh, aspect here to keep in mind. As we said earlier, uh, the star, the, the host star, 
uh, of this planet is what we call an A star. So and it's roughly 70% larger than the sun in radius and mass. And when it comes to stars, the bigger you are, the shorter your life is. So if the sun is now roughly uh, five uh, giga years old and expected to live another five giga years, so it's very middle aged, uh, this A star uh, is expected to live roughly two giga years. Meaning that uh, that planet does not have that long to live. So when you think about planets around more massive stars, they they they, they are doomed. <laughs> Hang on a minute. I thought I thought dwarf die. stars were longer lived. Or maybe I'm just thinking of the so red dwarfs. The terminology dwarf. Yeah, I think you, the terminology dwarf is actually any. Uh, Star that what we call on the main sequence. That's a main sequence yeah. star. It's not a tiny star, really. Phase. Okay. It can be a star from uh, from the very small stars down to uh, massive stars, as long as they are not evolved and becoming a giant as they evolve. So the dwarf terminology, like we mentioned in the beginning, is is a historic terminology, like a lot of terminology in astronomy, that nowadays is still used. But it is confusing. It, do, it doesn't contain the intuitive uh, meaning that you might attach to that terminology. That's one of the reasons uh, becoming a, a new student in astronomy is, is <laughs> very confusing. <laughs> um, so, and so like I said before, uh, the bigger you are, the shorter your lifetime. So if you're very small, like uh, a quarter of the size and mass of the sun, you essentially live forever, meaning yep, your lifetime years. is longer than the age of the universe. Right. And that that's where I was going with that particular comment. But you just said, because this is a, uh, the type, it's an A star, we're looking at two giga years, total lifespan. Roughly, very yeah. roughly. Okay. So this this thing does, is, is on borrow, that's not on borrow time. Where are, where are we in its lifespan, do you know? Is, it, is there a way the to tell? The star is now, uh, I think, uh, I'm not completely sure, but I would guess it's uh, just below the one giga year, maybe after, maybe beyond half a giga year and before oh. one giga year. But uh, <laughs> that's a very, the age of measuring or estimating stellar ages is one of the most difficult parameters that we can try and measure about stars. Um, so, because this star is relatively isolated. Yes. It's a system of, uh, well, of, uh, I mean, but it's not of, in a cluster. Of, of a few it's stars, a but beyond stars, that, you know how old it was. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, not in a cluster. If it was in a cluster, we'd have an age. Yeah. 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 You're right. Yes. Um, okay, well, let me get Philip W.'s question in. Why titanium oxide? Why not another compound? What's uh, those, why this one? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. That is a good question. And, what, and what's the SPF? Sorry, I had to do it. <laughs> yeah, what's the SPF? That's an interesting question. We could probably figure that out. Yes, right? we probably could. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but probably... not today. <laughs> but not today. <laughs> you can get back to us on that. Okay. It, might, it might be waterproof, though. Um, the, uh, okay, so why titanium oxide? Okay, so the reason is, is because like 10 years ago when people started thinking about this, um, they started trying to figure out if there were going to be stratospheres in these planets. And you can say to yourself, what do you need? You need something that absorbs uh, light, the, you know, absorbs sunlight in the optical. That's where stars put out most of their energy. So you need to absorb that energy, take it in, and then you need to re-radiate it as heat in the infrared. Um, and there's only a limited number of sort of compounds that fit that criteria, and titanium oxide is one of them. That's why it's used in sunscreen, because it absorbs, we're using it to reflect uh, light from the sun. Uh, it also will, you know, take it in, and it's not uh, not sunscreen form. Titanium oxide in the gas, it'll take it in. Um, so uh, it sort of, it fit the bill, and we see it in a lot of brown dwarfs. So we know it's out there all over the place, uh, it fit the bill, 
And so, uh, brown store, brown dwarfs are that step above hot Jupiters. Oh yeah. Yeah. I should say, yeah. Brown dwarfs are the sort of failed stars. They fused deuterium for a couple of hundred tens of million years. Um, yeah, I, was, I, I think there's still a lot of confusion. Talk about that it, with, uh, you know, star classifications between brown dwarfs and Jupiters and, and which is which I right. think there's. Uh, it turns out, I think if you could see a brown dwarf, a brown dwarf would be sort of lavender color. It would not be brown. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of that. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, Achilles, that goes to your question. Must be extra hot. What temp is required to create titanium dioxide gas? So you were saying... Uh, well, yeah, th this does turn into a gas on the side facing the star, right? It does. So at about uh, one atmosphere's worth of pressure, which is actually where we're looking at uh, these atmospheres, uh, you need to be above 1,800 Kelvin. Okay, with the time I have left, I want to talk about this coal trap. The 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 uh, press release mentioned it. I've never heard of it. What's a coal trap when we're, with respect to hot Jupiters and exoplanets? So a coal trap is an idea that was suggested years ago and um, has only been talked about a little bit. It's the idea that, um, so if you're, think about this dividing line in temperature, if 1800 Kelvin, or if you're above it, you're titanium oxide gas, and if you're below it, you've condensed, you form these solid particles of uh, titanium dioxide. Um, so a cold trap is on the day side, you're above 1800 degrees, you're 3000 degrees for Kepler 13. And on the night side, you're colder. You're probably 1000 or 12,000 Kelvin. So on the night side, the titanium oxide gas goes around, it condenses and it falls into the center of the planet and that traps it. It's this cold trap that's pulling it out of the atmosphere and removing it. Um, and so that's the idea is that it's snowing or raining out on the night side. Uh, and that's removing it from the atmosphere is why we don't see it. And so it's a spot sort of halfway up, you said, or so, or in the middle of the atmosphere of the planet that just brings uh, in cold because it's uh, a cold oh, no, area. It's, it's the night side. Huh? It's the night side of the planet. Right, that's what I, I know. But you said it falls about halfway down or something like that, too. Oh, well, presumably, actually, it'll just fall uh, deep in the interior. Okay, all right. Um, okay, cool. So, um... And this this was a surprise. Is that is that a rare thing to find in these in these sorts of observations? Well, so the exciting thing um, <laughs> I'd say the exciting thing uh, for the astronomers is less the sunscreen, but more that we this is really the first observational evidence that this process occurs. Um, so there's a paper from 2013 that predicts this and. Uh, this is really the first time we've seen something that seems to fit those predictions that it's actually falling out on the night side, um, which says that, you know, not only do you need to think about planets as, you know, just what's going on in the day side, right, which is what we see in the observations, you need to think about what's happening on the night side. And this, they're not these sort of one dimensional, just the day side, it's these planets are complicated things that are dynamically moving material from the day to the night and there's chemistry and there's rain and all these processes happening simultaneously. Okay. So, um, sorry about my mic volume guys. I don't tend to talk straight into the mic and that's what I need to start doing. So sorry, it's a bit low, but, uh, this should be better now. So I've just turned it up. Um, hopefully that's better. Okay. So, uh, let's see. Um, there's, uh, Jupiter doesn't, okay, this is from Kaiser Cube. Jupiter uh, doesn't radiate visible light. Brown dwarfs do. At least I think that's right, right? So, yes, it does not radiate visible light. But it does actually radiate more energy than it takes in, correct, from the sun? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, and Saturn actually is an even stronger case. Of that. Saturn really radiates. Uh, and that's also for rain processing. It is a helium in Saturn's atmosphere that's raining out. Um, in causing it to uh, get be hotter than it otherwise should be. Yes. Okay. Um, see. Let's see. Okay. So I now. Oh shoot. Okay. So uh, what? Do you, what are, are there other planets that you guys are looking at that are similar to this, or do you guys just look at all of Kepler data and see what? So I mean. I guess my question is, when it comes to exoplanet research, what are your main levels of interest? Uh, 
Are you looking mostly at hot Jupiters? Do you also study other kinds of planets? And do you use other data sets besides the Kepler data set? Um, tell us a little bit about the kind of work you do. How much time do you have? Uh, <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> well, do you, do you want to go first, Tommy? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll try to be quick. And if I'm not, just uh, feel free to stop me. Um, so, as I said earlier, uh, this planet is, is a bit unusual and, and different than the plan than most planets that we know, which is the reason why it is the focus of a lot of research and uh, and the current work where we use HST uh, HST data, uh, which is not easy to to get. Um, we are looking for these uh, precious uh, diamonds, so to speak, uh, in the data exactly for the reason that we want to, they are interesting, they are different than most of the sample, and we want to use our most sophisticated uh, instruments like HST and JWST in the next few years to study them in more detail. Uh, that's one of the, of the reasons that we are looking for planets, that we want to discover them and then study them in more detail. Like, for example, in this case, we studied the, the atmosphere and try to understand uh, the composition and structure and physical processes. Um, there are uh, uh, other uh, aspects, uh, for example, doing statistics, uh, discovering many, many planets, and then asking the question, what is the typical kind of planet? Are planets the size of Jupiter, are they the majority or are they, are they the minority? And for example, from Kepler alone, we, we know today that uh, large planets are actually uh, not the majority. Smaller planets, like below half the size of Jupiter, so for example, Neptune is roughly four times uh, the radius of the Earth, which is uh, 0.4 or 0.35, the, the radius of, uh, of, uh, of Jupiter. So planets, the radius of Neptune and even smaller, are the majority. And we know that from Kepler. And this is a statistical result. Meaning we need many, many planets to, to understand that. Um, and one of the holy grays, of course, of, uh, of exoplanets these days is to discover Earth-like planets. Uh, Which planets is what Kepler was designed to actually try and do. Kepler was actually designed to answer the question of what is the frequency or the occurrence rate of planets just like the Earth, Earth radius, Earth uh, orbit around a sun-like star. Um, and I think, uh, is, this, is this recorded? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. oh, oh, yes. This is going on the internet. It's not going anywhere. I think it would be fair to say uh, that Kepler gave at least a partial answer to, to that question. And um, well, that's not controversial. About I mean, that, yeah. and, um, there are several studies that uh, quoted different numbers on that. But you can at least say that today, based on Kepler data, that planets like the Earth are, are at least not very rare. Uh, oh, it said a lot more than that. I mean, they, they actually came yeah, back okay. with there is an average of 1.6 planets around every star in our Milky Way. Not every planet or not every star has a planet but statistically like you point out they are basically ubiquitous planets yeah not but, yeah, but, necessarily earth-sized ones but exactly includes all of them exactly. yeah right. planets are every star you can see with your own eyes at the night sky is likely to have at least one planet That's but right. the question of how many are really similar to earth and earth's orbit is not very many but if no. you're if you're narrow, if you're saying one Earth mass, if you say oh super Earth and all that stuff and any you know different kinds of orbits, I'm not you know if really? you if 93 you narrow, million miles from their stars, right? Yeah, if you are narrow, it's a bit gets a bit difficult to answer right. that question. But we know they are not very rare. That yeah, that that statistical statement uh, is something we do know. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like that in and of itself is exciting because, you know, there is, you can imagine a universe where Kepler just found nothing, right? Yeah. And yeah. Right. Exactly. I suppose that seems really, yeah. yeah. 
I get that. I get that. Twenty five or thirty years ago, we had no idea there were other planets besides right. ours. But yeah, it's, exactly. now it seems inconceivable. Wow. Right. So I yeah. I mean, I I agree with Avi that uh, Kepler. I think uh, you know didn't give a, a real specific answer, but at least gave us enough of an answer to know that they're out there. Uh, I think is very exciting to to know. So the fact that we know that they are out there means that we need to keep looking for them and keep uh, investing in building uh, more and more sophisticated and bigger telescopes on the ground and in space to look for them because we know that they are out there. And okay. Kepler, and, of course, is not the end of the line. It might be just the beginning. Give their characteristics. That's the... Right. Exactly. Yes. Right. So we have no idea. Say, oh, you know, I have 5,000 planets. It's like, yeah. And what are they? Yeah, the, the the joke I've I've heard is that to uh, to an exoplanet scientist, Earth and Venus are exactly the same. Yes, <laughs> uh, well, they're very close in radius, like ten percent different. Yeah, yeah, right, and they're about the same distance. Yeah. So yeah. the real question is, yeah. you know, there's all these planets that look like Earth, but how many of them are actually nice beach vacations, and how many right. melt your spacecraft? I know there's a big difference between Earth-sized, which is what Kepler was trying to find, and Earth-like. Uh, yes. So yes. yeah, we. We need to definitely get it. Maybe that's careful. a fair point. Yeah. yeah. So okay, speculation time. You guys study exoplanets. You know how many there are. There's a bunch. What do you think about the prospects of life out there? This is just speculation. I know you don't worry. Just what are your opinions? Uh, do you think that um, like we we're very excited about um, uh, the uh, Trappist One system, for example. We're also very excited about Proxima B and all of these other exoplanet possibilities with life. What do you guys think? I know, just an opinion. No one's going to hold you to it. But what do you what do you guys think about this idea of life in the universe? Are we going to find it in our own galaxy? Do you think? Um, so I'll go. I personally, I would be very surprised if in the next twenty years we don't have some uh, at least mildly decent evidence for life on another planet. I mean, I guess there's a scenario where there is no life, uh, but it, then maybe it's just because I'm hopeful. That seems like it's so hard to believe given the prevalence of these planets. Um, yeah. One interesting thing I realized, I was reading something about SETI actually, but you know, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, that SETI actually, you know, it hasn't detected anything, but that's still a success. Uh, in a way, right? Because there are, you can imagine as soon as we started looking that we're sitting in the middle of the, you know, the United Federation of Planets and everybody's broadcasting radio <laughs> intelligence all over the place. Yeah. Uh, so a non-detection for SETI is actually a result, right? Whatever intelligence is out there is super prevalent. But uh, So that could be one aspect of coming out with life, but I, I don't know. I, I would hope that it's pretty prevalent and if it is, I think we'll have some evidence for it in the next 10 or 20 years. Avi, any... any uh, so, of course, just beyond, to answer that question, you need to go beyond the scientific knowledge or the, what we know today. So, I, I, I hope there is something out there. Uh, if, if I can even say, I believe there is something out there. Right. But as a scientist, I cannot show you any evidence. I know. It's that. not a scientific not statement. Right I'm not asking you yeah. a scientific question. So <laughs> I totally get that answer. Uh, One of the reasons I'm in this field is because I, I'm, I'm hopeful. Yes. And um, it's possible. Yeah. With, and, and, and new telescopes like JWST and also the, uh, the ExoLife uh, uh, Planets Foundation telescopes that are, are hopefully going to be built will help shed some light on this. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I just like to ask it for people who you guys look at planets around other stars. And I'm sure you think about this once in a while. Uh, a lot of people speculate that we may find it, but the life that we see will be so radically different from our own that we maybe won't even recognize it. So there's all kinds yeah. of possibilities. Some, some scientists there. are thinking hard exactly about these kind of scenarios. Exactly. And it's a, it's a field of study that is relatively brand new. Right. So if you're young out there right. looking to get involved in science, exoplanets, astrobiology, all of these fields yeah. Yeah. really didn't really exist. Uh, 50 years ago. Carl Sagan, I think, was one of the first astrobiologists, maybe. I don't know if you're loose with the term. Um, but now it's a strong field, uh, as, as is the study of exoplanets. So these are, these are and, and this will go into gravitational waves, another area of science that is just brand new. So we, and today, uh, today is the 83rd uh, 
birthday of, of Carl Sagan. It is. That's right. Yeah, we, we are having a awesome. conference here at Caltech, so they said it. I didn't just remember it. I was, oh, <laughs> was going to say that's impressive, Avi. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys. Well, it is 4 o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and stop us here. I want to thank my guests, Dr. Thomas Beatty from Penn State University and Dr. Avi Spohr from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Thank you both so much for taking time out to talk to us about Kepler-13AB. And, yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, Thanks, and you. we hope you'll come back when you got more observations. Maybe you not bet. necessarily yeah. from Hubble, but from other places to talk about new, Absolutely. new research. So uh, yeah. be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> I always am. <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you all so much. And uh, okay. well, that is it for this this time around guys um i want to thank everybody for watching thank you guys for going to deepastronomy.space slash live testing it out for me it looked really cool there i really liked how that that setup so i think we're going to start using it more next week i want to thank my web developer jake for setting that up uh and yurik peter q thank you guys very much for, for participating thank all of you for your comments and questions they were great next week we have future in space and harley I don't know what it's about yet. So I will hopefully, <laughs> you guys will be here. It's going to be cool. I know because all of our hangouts are cool. You know that. And uh, so I'll let you know on our on our calendar on deepastronomy.space slash hangouts. That's where all of the events, once they've been finalized, have been put. So check it out early and often. And okay, we, Carol. Are, we are skipping Thanksgiving, but we'll be back on the 30th with Astronomy Coffee. That's right. As always, Thanksgiving. We're gonna that's a Thursday. I'm gonna be eating. I won't be able to talk. So um yeah, you're right. <laughs> I'll be too busy digesting on that day. Okay, okay, folks. Thank you all so much for listening and watching. And as always, keep looking up. Looking up. Thank you. Bye bye.